Even if I'm not, riveting read. Tonight's speaker is going to share her extraordinarily difficult and painful journey. And in the book, the author, our dear guest tonight, talks about finding faith and joy through loss. Relating to our current situation, my friends, and it shows you how connected we truly are. This is a soul connection. Who's not affected by what's going on in Eretz Yisrael? Our speaker will be sharing from personal experience how a Jew deals with pain, pain and fear, and does so with strength and with optimism. Without further ado, please help me welcome our illustrious author and speaker, Mrs. Devori Kreiman. kid, about 10 or 11, um, we were a family that didn't have a lot of money. A lot of kids, not a lot of money. So we didn't do trips very often. And I remember that we had a big trip. We had looked forward to it for months. We went to Six Flags Amusement Park. And the first attraction that I went to was called the Fun House. Hated it. It was dark inside. The floor was kind of, you know, un like unsteady, like shaky, and there was these narrow passageways. And every time we walked a little bit, it was hard to know where you we were going. It was very, very dark. These apparitions would kind of like just appear in front of us. I really it was kind of miserable. And when I came out, I was complaining and I was saying it shouldn't be called the fun house. It should be called the unfun house. And I, which my siblings teased me about for a long time, so that was something that stayed. And I couldn't understand why do people pay money and enjoy this. Then I got a little older and I understood. There's a thrill to being in a place and being frightened, let's say, or, you know, those rides that go dashing down at 200 miles per hour and you feel like you're going to hit the ground. But you can enjoy the experience because you know, you know, that even though it feels like you're about to hit the ground, or even as I was going through the unfun house and it was dark and I couldn't see the way out, I knew that somebody designed this and there is a plan and I'm going to come out okay. So you get the experience of the fear, but you know, there's a, there's a planner, I'm going to be all right. It didn't occur to me then that all I needed to do in the dark was turn on a little light, and then I would be able to see that the apparitions are probably just some rags thrown together. I'm a little older now, and I recognize that part too. But here we are, dark, ground is a little bit unshaky, not only in Israel, but for Jews all over the world. And people are asking, they're saying, what do you mean we're going to be okay? I don't feel so okay right now. And how can God allow such a thing? How can God let this happen? There was a, a Jew, an Israeli Jew, who was non observant, and he happened to be Yom Kippur. He happened to be spending it in Crown Heights. And I, I understand that the group has probably been, some of you have been there, um, happened to be in the headquarters of Chabad in New York with a relative. And the relative said, Come on, come to Shul with us. Came to Shul, and he's looking for the machzer. And he reads the story of the 10 martyrs. And it's horrific. It's not just that 10 great sages were killed by the Romans, but it's actually barbaric. It describes in detail the terrible way that they were tortured. And he can't handle it. He's reading it and it just sounds awful. And it also tells a little bit of the backstory about the, the sages talking to God, asking, and about the angels. And the angels confront God. And they say, how can you let, this is Torah? This is the reward? These are great sages. How can you let such a thing? And God says, you know, sometimes when you're driving in the freeway and your kids are acting out and they're going to say, one more word and I'm going to pull over and that's it, you know, leave you on the side of the road. That's pretty much what God said. God said, one more sound out of you and I'm going to turn the whole world over. I'm going to make it back to what it was, chaos, water. So this man is reading this. He says, what is this? There's this horrific torture. The angels, not even people, angels have questions. Asking God and God says, one more word out of you and I'm going to turn everything. What is that? So they could see that he was very disturbed. So one of the rabbis came and said, let me explain it to you. And he says, there was a king who was marrying off his child. I've seen it, a son, a daughter, different versions, but marrying off his child. And he needed a garment, but not just any garment, an exquisite garment. And he had fabric that was studded with gems. And he hired a tailor, Jewish tailor, to create this garment for him for the wedding. 
And when the tailor created the garment, then the king was so happy with it. But of course, as always, when a Jew is successful, the other ones started to say, you know, he, he probably cheated you. And they started to put that in the king's, uh, the king's mind. Where are the scraps? It's very valuable fabric. So the king said, that's a good point. Always when you, when you make something, you use a pattern. The scraps is left over. It's very valuable. He called the tailor. He said, where are the scraps? And the tailor said, there are none. There are none. You must have stolen it into, into prison, sentenced to death. In those days, I guess, you know, this is how it was. But he had a, a last request right before he was sentenced to death. And he said, bring me back the garment, bring me a table, bring me my tools. He took the garment, opened it up, took apart every seam, laid it out, and there's the exact fabric that he had been given. And he showed them every single inch, every single scrap, all of it was used. And the rabbi said, it's not that God was screaming, one more word out of you and I'll destroy the world, you don't get a voice. God was saying, the world as it exists now, this is a world of concealment, we cannot understand. There are horrific things happening, there's a real presence of evil, we cannot understand. The only way that we can really see how all of it fits together at a soul level, not to minimize the suffering and the pain, but the only way we can see how it all fits together <laughs> is if the world were to go back, to be dismantled completely to a state that you can see the journey of the souls and the purpose. We don't get to do that. We don't get to know. We can, however, bring light. So in the context of that, my story, uh, my husband and I, he's here, married 37 years, and you know, rabbis, large families, we were gonna have a large family. Um, we had eight children, and it turned out that of our eight children, four out of our eight children were born with a very unusual mitochondrial disorder. They were born missing the enzyme that turns food into energy. And we didn't know it until most of them were born. Doctors in the beginning didn't know, it's very rare. So we had a few children like this until we really knew exactly what we were dealing with. Um, and we had four healthy children, a son and three daughters. My daughter's there in the back. Um, and we were very determined, my husband and I. We were not gonna be that family. In Yiddish, the word is nebuch. There's no English word for it. Like that poor, unfortunate, you know, look at them, another child sick in the hospital or another child just died because we had four healthy children and it was, it was a project, but we really worked on raising our kids and they look back now and they don't see a childhood that was full of, you know, the specter of illness and death, although there was 10 years of it, but for the most part, we raised a family that was healthy, wholesome. And our kids grew older and our oldest, our son Yossi, he was dating. And Yossi was just a very unusual, exuberant, interesting kind of a child. And it was this time of year. It was actually the holiday of Simchas Torah, which is really such a happy holiday, except that now when we say Simchas Torah, a very deep shadow falls over us. But Simchas Torah is a holiday of joy. And Yossi comes to me and his face is like red and his eyes are kind of bright. And my husband doesn't drink, he never drank. I didn't know what I was really looking at. But by one in the morning, he hadn't come home and I got nervous. I said, we have to go back and get him. So we walk all the way back to the shul. And at that point, everything's pretty much over. And there's just a bunch of like slumped over, you know, dark. And they all look the same from the back forms, you know, and I'm looking, you know, till I find Yossi and like tapping him. And he's like gone at this point, you know. And finally, I get him to get up and he comes outside. And the ear in L.A. at the one, two in the morning, whatever time it was, already really late. Um, the ear was very crisp. So he got like a second wind. He was still pretty drunk, but he got, a, he got like revived a little bit. And he starts to run up and down the sidewalk, flapping his arms like an airplane. And he's shouting, flight number, whatever, from Los Angeles to New York. And he's shouting the name of the girl he's dating. We're Hasidic, we don't do that. And then he gets really excited. He's somersaulting on the filthy sidewalk. Now we bought him a whole new dating wardrobe, right? You get a new dating wardrobe and a new hat, new suit, new shoes. And he's somersaulting and it's really late, but now it's early in the morning and I'm getting frustrated because it's just me and my teenager and him. So I said to him, Yossi, you're impossible. So he gets up, he looks at me, he says, I'm not impossible, I'm possible. I'm possible, and I guess he liked the sound of that. So the whole way home, he's dancing backwards in front of me. I'm possible, I'm possible. Sometime after that, it was a Friday afternoon, Yossi, who was a lover of nature, had spent the summer in Costa Rica as a learning director. He was supposed to be teaching and learning, but he also got to go on the trips. And one of the trips was scuba diving. And he fell in love with the nature and he was going for a certification. So this was a couple of months later. It was Friday afternoon. The police called my husband, my husband called me. They had had to pull Yossi out of the water. Something had gone wrong with the equipment. We went to the hospital. And I knew going to the hospital from what I could hear, I knew it wasn't good. And the whole way to the hospital, I kept repeating the same thing again and again and again. I kept saying, this is not the babies, this is Yossi. This is not the babies, this is Yossi. I was reminding God, something terrible already happened. We already lost 
half of our children, of the four babies that had this mitochondrial disorder, none of them survived. They're, they all died as infants. And I'm reminding God, my children are divided into two parts. I have the sick children, they died. I have the four healthy ones, they're fine. Yossi belongs to that group, and I'm saying it like a prayer again and again, reminding God. You know how that happens sometimes when you go through something very big? So you assume, I'm done now, I did my thing, right? I had 10 years of sick children, I did my thing. I'm done, this is not the babies, no, 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 this is the part of life that's good. You're not gonna mess this. And I'm saying it, and I'm saying it like to myself and to God, reminding him, the babies died, half our children died, we have four healthy children, this is Yossi, he's healthy, he's getting married. But when we got to the hospital, they asked us to go in a small room, which is never a good sign. And they said, we did everything we could, and they said, we're so sorry. And just like that, Yossi was gone. And it was almost Shabbos. We had to go home. There was nothing we could do there. We went home. We had Shabbos. And Sunday, we buried Yossi in the same cemetery that already held our, our four babies. The last day of Shiva was a Friday. And it was already afternoon, so Shiva was pretty much over. So there was just a few stragglers left. Everyone had pretty much left at that point. I was sitting on my patio, and I was thinking, everyone's going to go home. You know, people do their thing, and then they go home, and you're expected to get up, and you go on, and, you know, life continues. It's not going to happen. I'm sitting in this low chair, and I'm thinking, I will not. I just will not be able to. And my mind was going into a pretty dark place. And actually, it even scared me. And I knew sometimes you just got to stop thinking. You just got to stop thinking. I didn't know how. So I turned to the woman next to me. Her name is Judy Weingard. She's a professional singer. And I said to her, I don't even know why it popped in my head. I said, Judy, sing something. She looked at me like I'm insane. We don't sing during Shiva. But I said, I need to stop thinking. I need to hear a song. So she got all flustered. What should I sing? What should I sing? So she turned to the woman next to her as a former student of mine. What should I sing? How many songs are there in the world? Millions, trillions, billions? I don't know. Of all the songs in the world, here is the song that my former student suggested and that Judy sang to me in the last moments of, of Shiva. It's possible. It's possible. Everything is possible. Just keep your mind upon your goal. Turn to God with all your soul. It's possible. It's possible. And I saw Yossi dancing in the night. It's possible. I'm possible, he said. And with those words, we did, we did get up from those low chairs of Shiva. Truth. Sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes it's really too hard. But Yossi didn't say it's possible. Yossi said, I'm possible. And here's what stayed with me from that. All of us, we are really, if you think about it, life, a human being, Jew, it's really an impossible fusion. What are we? We are soul in a body. It's, it's matter and spirit together. It's an impossible fusion. But really what we have in us, all of us, I'm possible. We're all possible if we can just tap in to the part within us. It's a breath of God. It's soul. It's a touch of infinity. If we can tap into that. And what does it mean? That's a very abstract idea. But very, very simply, when we look at this world only as a physical entity or as an existence in and of itself, it's pretty depressing and kind of scary. But when we can tap in to what's possible in us, which is a part of soul, we become aware of bigger, of our soul journey, our souls, our part of God, a bigger plan, something greater than we can understand. We can draw infinite measures of strength. Look at us after these news, these last couple of weeks. As a nation, how much have we walked, right? We've survived the Egyptians and the Greeks and, and the Spanish and the Romans, right? I mean, pogroms and Kazakhs and, I mean, just name it, you know, the Crusades and the Holocaust, you know? I mean, they're just going through all the things and even the more recent history, the bombings and the stabbings and then the missiles. We walk, we gather together, we hold on, we walk. Because what we do, we don't get stuck on why did it happen. As Jews, as soon as something happens, something even so, so, so terrible that everybody's walking right now, you know, the ground is shaky. We ask right away, what do I need to do? How will I get through this? That sometimes, I can only speak for me, so I will speak for me, my reaction when faced with something that I knew was life altering was no, 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 no. I don't want this, I don't want to be in this, I don't want to be doing this, no. One of my babies, when she was in the hospital, I went to be with her. She was the sickest child in that hospital. She was dying. And I went to be with her. And before I went upstairs to her room, I went to the lobby to go to the bathroom. And in the bathroom, there was a sign. You have them in many bathrooms. And it said, baby changing station. I looked at that and I thought, ah, ha, ha, ha. 
baby changing station. That's what I want. And I had a crying fit by the baby changing station. And I'm actually crying out to God and I'm saying, I want to change my baby. I want to change my baby for a baby that works. And I'm doing this whole thing at the baby changing station. Right after my whole, I want to change the baby thing. I'm holding my baby and I'm thinking, and again, it's going to sound absurd, but here it is. We don't get to change the baby. Imagine your kid acts out in school and you tell the teacher, you know, I don't want that kid, he's too much trouble. Give me a different kid. Like we understand that this is our journey. This is our family. I'm holding this baby and I'm thinking, I don't know why she's in this world. I don't know why this soul was put into this body to suffer because she, she pretty much suffered all her life. So did, you know, all four of them did. And I don't know, I don't know that. But I know that there are certain lessons that even now I can already appreciate. I have to give to her. I have to show up at the hospital. I have to hold her. I have to soothe her. She's never going to say thank you. She's never going to call me mommy. I'm never going to get anything back. She's giving me the gift of unconditional love. And against the backdrop of all the negative emotions, this was not a negative emotion. This felt, it felt like a wow moment. I remember that feeling, an awareness of something bigger. Like it's a soul moment. And I understood she's not a mistake. We could explain it scientifically, but she's not a mistake. This is a soul in a body with a purpose. And my husband and I, it's not a mistake that it happened to be that we have this genetic makeup. We are the ones who were chosen to usher in and out of this world, to take these children and usher them through. Not a mistake. We're here to do the work. We're here, all of us, souls and bodies. And if we're in this world, then we have a job that only we can do. There's no mistakes, no extra people. We are all here with a job to do. And our job, exactly what we need, is what we face when we have to go through this world. God gives us the talents and the challenges to do the work we need to do. Before there was this world, this physical world, there was only light. That's all there was. Light, which is God and goodness, it was clear. But God wanted a world like this, a physical world with real people, with real struggles, our own internal struggles and struggles from those around us, all kinds of struggles. God wanted it and real evil and all that. God wanted a world like this. But you can't have a world like this when there's light because the light shines on everything. So God had to roll back the light. We actually say it in our prayers. He rolled up the light. And then we have this world. What is our job? Why are we here? Our job is to bring back the light. The first words that God said in the Torah, the very first words, anybody? Here he are. Let there be light. Let there be light. Let it be light. We need light. That's the work. That's exactly the work. It's a very big concept. What does it mean, light? It's very simple. Every moment of our day, we are making a choice. How do I use this moment? What does it mean to bring light, to do something for someone else, to do something to become better ourselves? We can show courage, we can show empathy, we can show generosity. Every moment we make a choice, dark or light, how do I do it? And you know, we're thinking now because of the war, I cannot drive a tank or serve in the IDF, but I can support from the back. I can say prayers, I can give money, I can take on extra deeds. We are all, we are all in this fight now. And if ever there was a fight between dark and light, it's now. But here's the good news. You can have a room that's very, very dark. Let's say a massive amount, as much as you can quantify it, of darkness. And if you just light one little candle, you've got the light. It doesn't take a lot. A little bit of light can dispel a whole lot of darkness. So how do we do it? First of all, by recognizing we're in a spiritual war. This is not a war about rights or land. This is a war about the existence of Jews and the existence of the Holy Land. This is a spiritual war. We're all in it. And it's a war that's being fought moment by moment by all of us, every one of us. And we do this really by asking ourselves every time. And for me in my life, I think of it in a very practical way. Because there's such brutality, I'm making an effort to have more gentleness. Because we were blessed for so many years and maybe we forgot, I'm making an effort to have a little bit more gratitude. It's small things. I'm making an effort when I say the prayers, not to say them casually and quickly because I'm so used to them, but to actually see what they mean. And when the words of the Psalms come alive, wow, you realize how relevant they are. To pay more attention, more mindfulness, to counteract brutality and harshness and cheapness of life with awareness of the preciousness of life, with gentleness with each other, with reaching out one to the other so that we can be united and then nobody can break us. On a very basic level, you want joy? Find something to be grateful for and acknowledge it. Even deeper, to someone else. The absolute greatest joy that a person can feel, it's not pleasures, it's the feeling that we accomplished something, that we came into this world, we were given a lot of gifts, 
some challenges, and we used our time in this world and our gifts in this world to become better people, to spread some light, to care for others, to do some good. It's the greatest, deepest feeling. It's the joy of the soul. That everything in this world is God. There is only God. I still believe in God. I still believe in God. I used to believe in soul. We are souls before we come down to this world. We are souls after we leave this world. In this world, we are doing the work of a soul in a body. Do I still believe in soul? Still believe in soul. So what used to work still works. So maybe bruised and battered, but we can get up. We can keep going. And I'm going to end with this. People say to me sometimes, because I speak, they say, oh, you, you were born religious. It's easier for you. You, you're spiritual. You, you're happy. Somebody think if you're wearing lipstick, you're happy. You, you're strong. Me, I'm not that. And people, I get that a lot. I'm not that. Like, you know, you, you, it's easy for you. You pray, you do, you're, 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 you're that. I'm not that. But it's not really how it works. After Yossi died, I started the night before the funeral, but I had done it by the babies too. I started to journal. I started to write and write and write. But if you would have asked me, what did I do the whole first year after Yossi died? I would have said nothing. I cried and I cried, but I wrote. And I thought I'm just journaling because I had a lot to say. God was looking down and saying, honey, you're writing a book. But here's what I learned. I really captured a lot of, I call the process inelegant. It was a big mess. I was just, we did things that are just insane. At his funeral, as we're burying him, one of my daughters was holding my daughters, and one of them said to me, this, so she saw the crowds of people, she said, Yossi must be loving all this attention. And we laughed as we buried him. Because sometimes you're so crazed with grief, and it's not something I ever wanted to admit, but I wrote it, and I published it. I would, would binge eat during the night when I couldn't sleep, and I once did a crazy, had an argument with my husband, and I did a, a driving that was like just insanely crazy, and then people were talking to me during the shiva, and I was jealously counting how many children they had. Not proud of the journey, but I also recorded. I wrote down my own struggle, and this is where we can all identify when we're going through something difficult, and we get thrown off, we start asking ourselves, who am I? And I really was looking, and I was asking myself on a lot of levels, who am I as far as other people? How can I relate to someone else who didn't lose most of their children when I have lost most of my children? How will I ever have a conversation with someone who doesn't know what that feels like? And who am I as a mom? Am I still Yossi's mom? I didn't know then the, the answer is an absolute yes, a resounding yes, but I didn't know how. And who am I with a God who I feel has abandoned me? How do we do that? And I wrote The Honest Struggle, and here's what I've learned. There is no such thing as being strong, happy, spiritual, at least not for me. And many of the people I meet all the time are in that state. What there is is a moment by moment choice. Even these days, if I wake up and I'm feeling sorry for myself, it'll be something will trigger me or whatever it is, and I'll feel sorry, I can say, even though I'm feeling sorry for myself, I can still take a moment to have empathy for another person. I can put myself out of the way for one moment and think about another person. I feel like I don't have enough, I can give a little bit to someone else. I'm not feeling so spiritual. I can say a little bit of a prayer. I can listen to five minutes of a class. I can do a little bit, I can do a little bit. That's really the only way, and I'm gonna close with this. A few years ago, I had an appointment in a, in a building, an office building, and ended in the evening. And when I came out, I took the elevator, and the elevator, when I got out of the elevator, the elevator area was lit, but the whole parking structure, was an underground parking structure, was black. And my car was somewhere in there. It was night, I was alone, and I was scared. There was no lights at all except for by the elevator. And I think, I don't want to go into that black alone. But I had no choice. My car is there. So I took a step. And as soon as I took a step, a light went on above my head. And I realized we've got motion. And this is really how it works. We stand there. We look out. We say, I can't do this. I can't do this. This is scary. This is sad. We shouldn't look too much. But if we're looking at some of the stuff that's going on, it just tears our hearts. How are we going to be OK? How is this OK? How are we going to manage? It's black. It's evil. It's frightening. But we have to bring light. We have to bring light. That is the response of a Jew. What do you mean bring light? How do you bring light? One little deed. We smile at someone who we may have had a little argument with. We give a few pennies or $1,000, thank you. You do a little thing. You show up for a class. You say a prayer. You take a step, light goes on. You take a step, a light goes on. And before you know it, the whole world, light. Thank you.